Hey guys, welcome back. So today I'm working on this Generac GP7500E. Uh, this machine belongs to Brendan. He's a local guy who buys and sells equipment and he picked this one up about half a year ago. According to the clock, it only had 20 hours on it and this machine is very clean, but it has a big problem and that's that it doesn't make power. Anyway, about a month ago, he brought it to me to diagnose and what I found was that the rotor was bad. So he took it back. It's been sitting in the corner of his shop just waiting for a power head because I don't have one that'll fit that. Anyway, if you remember a few months back, actually the last GP7500 video I did, that one belonged to Jason and that one also wasn't making power due to a bad rotor. So Jason was able to find a new power head. We got it installed and then we found out the engine was complete trash. It is not rebuildable. I would say that engine was underwater at some point. So we have two GP7500s, one with a bad power head and Jason's with a bad engine. So fast forward to today and I now have a third Generac GP7500. Uh, this one is pretty dirty. It would clean up uh, and it actually was given to the channel by Ken of Ken's small engine. This was a customer's machine. It started to run poorly and Ken believes it is a bad camshaft. And that is a fairly common problem with some of these engines. So if that's the case, this engine can easily be repaired and this thing will be 100%. But given that we have three GP7500s that don't work, I think the better approach here might be to use this one as a parts machine to save Brandon's machine as well as Jason's. So Jason's will be a separate video, uh, but for today, I think we'll get Brendan's up and running. So let's get this one out of the car. We'll get it up on the lift. I just want to validate the diagnosis. And if the cam is in fact bad, we'll just harvest that power head and move it on over to this machine. So let me get set up a little bit better and get going on this. I'm going to start just by pulling the spark plug so that we don't have compression fighting us. And then I want to get the valve cover off and just rotate the engine, see what the valves are doing. Now these bolts too, holding the valve cover on, they're very small. They're undersized. They do have a tendency to break. So we're going to have to be careful. Uh, there's six of them holding this cover on. Yeah, we got clearance on both valves. The intake's opening, I would say, a lot further than the exhaust. Uh, the exhaust is open right now, and it didn't really open that much. So I think we do need a camshaft here. Anyway, I'm just going to measure the valves when they're open. 
versus closed. So right now the intake is closed. And the top of that spring is 27.2 millimeters. Let's rotate the engine till it's open and see how far it opens. Now we're at 22.9. Let's see what the exhaust is at when it's closed. It's at 26 millimeters. And it's open as far as it goes. And we're now at 24.5. So it's only opening one and a half millimeters. And that's a pretty big difference from the intake. So yeah, new camshaft for sure. Uh, the good news is most likely this engine can be saved later for Jason. So for now, I'm going to get the valve cover back on just to keep the dirt out. And we'll get that power head off. I'm actually going to start by disconnecting all the wires in the power head because I want to test it. I want to make sure it's good before I go to the effort of swapping it over to the other machine. That is an interesting setup. Let me turn the light on so you can see it a little better. Usually we have either three or four wires on the posts here. You know, in this case, we only have two. So I'm assuming we're dealing with leg one and leg two. And the neutrals, rather than coming over to here and then jumping to ground for a neutral bonded, they're actually going straight to ground, which is okay. It's just a little odd. I have never seen it done like that. Anyway, let's get these four wires disconnected. We'll get the AVR out as well and just test everything real quick and see if it's good. That was pretty loose. And so was that one. Not a good sign. And the insulation's a little bit low, so we'll have to cut that back a little. And same with that one. Yeah, everything is loose down here. So I'm wondering if those white wires where they were, if that was factory or someone for some reason made a modification down here. I mean, we are missing these posts on the end, which is also unusual. Usually they're there. Whether they're used or not is a different story. So 
All you need to test this is a multimeter and it doesn't have to be a good one. This one's a cheap one, but it needs to be able to measure ohms. So before you start, test the resistance of your leads. And sometimes it can be quite high. So that'll make a difference when you're doing these tests. In my case, it's only 0.1 ohms. So any reading I get down here, I can subtract the internal resistance from that to get the true reading. So I'm going to start with the rotor because I know that's what we need from this power head. I mean, we can take the whole thing or just the rotor. Now, usually these come in between 40 and 70 ohms. This one might be a little higher because we're going through the brushes. And in this case, we are significantly high. So yeah, that is not a good thing. Let's get the brushes out. We'll try testing against the slip rings directly. Brushes were also loose. And this has been sitting for a long time too. I can see the slip rings are pretty dirty. Some corrosion on them. So that might be the issue we're dealing with here, I hope. Let me get some scotch bright, try to clean a spot. It looks better. Let's see how it tests. Beautiful. 53 ohms. That's a nice healthy reading. Let's check it to ground. There should be no connection and there's not. So the rotor is good. Let's check leg one. The resistance should be very low. About 0.3 or 0.2 ohms. And we're at 0.4, 0.3. So that is good. Check it to ground, no connection to ground. So that is also good. Let's check the other one. 0.3.4, that is also good. And no connection to ground. So yeah, this power head seems to be good. The DPE winding seems to be good. We'll check it to ground. No issues there. And the sense winding. Let's make sure it's not open. It should be a low reading. Similar to the stator. And actually, we're not going to get that because it's actually monitoring the 240. And right now it's all disconnected. So we should have a connection over to one of these but not the other. And then if I switch over here to the other sense wire, it'll be the opposite. I think. Yeah. Got a reading there, no connection to ground. So yeah, I mean, we could test this a few other ways, but things are actually looking pretty good. And I know Ken said this was making power the last time it ran, which was about four or five years ago. So I just wanted to make sure that the corrosion hadn't have changed anything. And it seems like we're okay. So let's keep going here. In order to get the stator and rotor off, we need to get the exhaust out of the way because that's attached to the stator. And once that's removed... I think we'll be able to remove these bolts going around as well as the bolts holding the end housing onto the frame and get the stator uninstalled. And just a little side note here, that high resistance we saw on the slip rings due to the corrosion, you know, that's something that would most likely clean itself up once the engine starts rotating. Uh, it's just because this engine hasn't run in so long, we have corrosion and buildup on the slip rings and that's why we couldn't get a good reading.
Usually before I get the exhaust bolts out on the head, I got to remove this shield on the top that guides the cooling air over the head. You know, that said, I think I have a good shot on this one and potentially I can get the back one. So I want to try that without removing this shield. There we go. We'll disconnect this. This is just the lead, the negative, going over to the battery, which is dead. It's really strange how some of these bolts are so loose. These bottom ones are barely on there. So we are pretty much ready to get the stator off. We have the wire harness disconnected, the exhaust is gone. We've kind of got the stator floating here in the engine supported by this piece of wood. So once we remove these four bolts, kind of sandwiching everything together, we're most likely gonna need a puller to get this bearing out of the in-housing. So I'm gonna squirt a bit of PB Blaster in there, that might help a little, and lightly apply some force to get that ball bearing to unseat. See if we'll get lucky on this one. Nope, it's not moving. And it doesn't surprise me. The corrosion tends to lock them in, both on the bell housing side and the end housing. So this one could be a bit of a challenge. I'm gonna use three jaw puller. A two jaw works better, but I like distributing the force as much as possible because yeah, this will break the end housing with minimal effort. Just make sure these jaws don't go where the brushes go, because that's where it's the weakest. And you shouldn't have to apply much force. If you're applying too much force, you know, stop. Maybe hit the end of the puller with a hammer. With a mallet, you can kind of hit around the bell housing, just try to break things free. Otherwise, you're gonna break the end housing. Oh yeah, it's coming. Feels like it's hung up. Yeah, it was hung up a bit. There's a lot of rust on this rotor. 
So ideally, that wouldn't be there. You know, you could sand it a bit. I guess my concern is there's laminations here. They are insulated. Although they can't be insulated that well if we've got rust. So I might hit that very lightly just to get a little more clearance. Now this generator too, it was not stored outdoors, but it was in a basement and it's quite humid. I'm sure it's just condensation forming on this rotor that caused the surface rust. Let's just take a second and polish up those slip rings. Gonna do the easy thing here and hit this bolt. I didn't drive it all the way in. It is maybe a quarter of an inch from seating. So if I hit it a few times without missing, the rotor should pop off the tapered shaft. Of course, you don't wanna miss because, well, the rotor will be destroyed. So we'll give it a few hits. And if it works, it's gonna save a bunch of time. There we go. So we've got what we came for. We have a good GP7500 rotor. And good, yeah, I guess that's questionable how you define good, but a test well and it should work just fine. So I'm gonna get this generator off the lift. We'll get the other one up on here and I'm gonna do the same process. It'll be off camera unless I find something interesting. Otherwise, I'll turn you back on when we get close to popping the rotor off the other machine. Well, the good news is this one is wired exactly the same way. We have the two white wires connected directly to this bolt where the ground wire is. We also have the red and black. Now this stator, it's much cleaner than the one I just pulled off. So I think I'm gonna use this stator and just put the other rotor in its place since this seems to be in much better condition. So the issue I found with this rotor when Brandon brought it by a month or so ago was that there was an open on the slip rings. So when I test it now, we actually get 53 ohms, which is perfect. So when he visited the last time, I did try to reflow the solder. Uh, the wire wasn't broken. It was just a bad connection on the terminal where it connects to the slip ring. And after doing that, I did get a reading. But as soon as the engine spun up, the connection would be lost. So I wasn't able to repair it with the tooling that I have. He brought it back to his shop, and he actually reflowed the solder on each of the slip ring terminals. And before he did that, he removed the stator. So we had really good access to it. And, you know, on the surface, it appears like it's repaired. But if I go down 
on one of the terminals and just, if I can find it, and just move the wire a little bit. Oh. See, it started acting crazy. Let me move it again. Oh, see, it's jumping around. So, yeah, it's actually not as bad as I thought it would be. But it's still not a great connection. I can get it to fluctuate quite a bit. And of course, when this rotor is spinning at 3600 RPM, any weakness there is just going to fail. And I've tried fixing these before. And what I find is that, you know, I can get them to work. But sometimes they work for a minute, sometimes a couple hours, you know, maybe a couple weeks. But in the end, you know, I don't have the proper tooling to reattach this. This wire is actually aluminum. And a lot of times they don't wash the flux off. So there's a lot of corrosion. The wire is weakened. And it's just not worth trying to repair, especially when I have one that has never been broken. So I'm going to get the stator off, the rotor off, and I'm going to reuse this stator. It seems to be fine. I did just test it real quick. I don't see any issues with it. So yeah, let's get these off and then put the good on. You can kind of see right there where he reflowed the solder. Which that one's actually sticking. The one on the bottom is the one that's a little bit questionable. And I do see he dripped a little bit on the stator, which isn't a good thing. Because those wires, they are insulated and you don't want to bridge the wires together. So yeah, that I'd like to get it off if I can. Let me pick at that a bit. This one's going to fall right off. Yeah, maybe not.
got the spark plug out and the starter recoil back on. So now is a good time to just pull the engine over. Without the spark plug, there should be no compression fighting me. And what I want to do is just make sure the rotor rotates without binding. There should be no scraping, no binding. And if there is, something's wrong. You know, take the stator off, put it back on, and try it again. Beautiful. No issues to report. The rotor rotated without making contact, so let's just finish up the wiring. We'll throw the exhaust back on, start it up, and hopefully we get power. Looks like these terminals are fine. The insulation isn't coming down too far. So we're just gonna wire it up the same, but in reverse. So the two live wires go down on the terminal here. The neutrals and the ground go up to that bolt. The red wire goes on the left brush terminal. That is the positive. Well, since we're here, let's just take a quick look at these valves. I want to see or measure how far they open. On the other engine, it was one and a half millimeters on the exhaust, and I think the intake was about five millimeters. The exhaust is open now, so let's actually start with the intake. And closed, the height is 24.6. And open, we're at 19.3, so that's a very big difference on the intake from the other engine. Let's try the exhaust. The valve closed, the exhaust is 26 millimeters tall. And 19.3 tall with it open. So that, that's a huge difference. So yeah, I think it was the right call on the other engine. The camshaft for sure is worn out. While we're here too, let's just check the valves, they do seem a bit tight. Three thousandths fits. 
Four does. Has a bunch of drag, though, so I'd say it's probably closer to three than four. A little tight, but actually not too bad. Let's check the exhaust. So with the intake valve open, we can now check the opposite valve, which is the exhaust. Three fits just fine. Four actually fits fine too. So I think the valves are fine. Let's just see if a five fits. Yeah, and a five fits. A little tight, but I think the valves, they are good. Just double check the oil. This has an oil sensor. There is some on the dipstick, though we are pretty low. So I am gonna top that off for now. All right, it's the moment of truth. I've got a light plugged in and turned on, and I've also got the kilowatt. So the plan is to just start it long enough to validate that we have power. We'll double check the voltage and the Hertz. And if everything looks good, then we'll put the end cover on and bring it outside. Beautiful. It started right up and we have power. So this machine appears to be in pretty good shape. I mean, the voltage, it was dead on at 120 volts and the Hertz were just over 60 Hertz. So I think we're ready to throw that end cover on and roll this thing outside. Actually, slight change of plan. I think this thing has earned an oil change. It's pretty clean, actually. I was just getting things ready to test this thing out and I was gonna run it off the external tank because I thought this tank was dry. And when I removed the fuel line, I found there was a bit of fuel in the tank and surprisingly, not much. But what came out kind of looks like fruit punch and even worse, if I tilt it, you can see on the bottom there, there is water. So I'm just gonna pull the drain bolt real quick on that carb, make sure there's no water in there. Yeah, there is a little bit of water in that fuel. Not a ton, but it doesn't take much. You know, if water gets in the car bowl, it can't pull it up through the main jet and the engine won't run. So yeah, I'm actually surprised it ran at all given the color of this fuel 
and the fruit punch that came out of the tank. Anyway, we'll get the external tank hooked up now that everything is drained and give this thing a try. Yeah, not too bad. It was a little bit hard to start, but that was user error. I had the choke backwards in my mind, so once I figured that out, the engine started right up and had no issues. You know, we started at about 122 volts, 60 and a half hertz, which was too low, and about 5% total harmonic distortion. So I brought the no load speed up closer to 61 and a half hertz, and then put a 3000 watt load on this machine and the harmonic distortion jumped quite a bit to about 17 percent uh, the engine speed had no problems it was right at 60 and a half and then i brought it up to 6,000 watts and again the distortion jumped up to about 21 and a half which is pretty high i mean usually on generators like these it's about 15 to 20 percent with that kind of a load so this one was just a bit higher anyway the voltage pretty much throughout was at 122 volts, so no issues to report there. And the engine speed, even under 6,000 watts, held just fine at 59 and a half hertz. So, you know, overall, there's really nothing wrong. You know, this machine is doing what it should. Uh, the engine can pull a load, and of course, we are now making power. So, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.